what was evident was that Mozart was simply transcribing music completely finished in his head. And finished as most music is never finished. This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. A revival of the brilliant play Amadeus has just opened on Broadway. We're very honored to have the man who wrote it with us tonight. And here to introduce him, my co-host, the Mozart of theater journalists, Michael Riedel, sure. in more ways than one. Well, yeah. I think Sally Ari is uh, <laughs> a little closer to my <laughs> the kind of journalism that we practice at the New York sure. Post. <laughs> Peter Schaffer is one of the major dramatists of the 20th century. I don't think that's too much of a stretch to say. His plays include Equus, The Royal Hunt of the Sun, Lettuce and Lovage, and of course the brilliant, as Susan said, Amadeus, which is being revived on Broadway at the Music Box Theater. Mr. Schaffer, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Um, now, I know that you have uh, been tinkering with Amadeus and rewriting some of it. With all due respect, I don't think there's much wrong with, with Amadeus. <laughs> what has compelled you to go back and uh, rethink and, and rework this play? I think, uh, first let me say that the, uh, the, the chance of doing it is always very tempting because it's the one area in which I think playwrights are much, much luckier than screenwriters because you get another, if it's, uh, that's to say, if it's successful the first time, you get another crack at it. You, and of course, it's been virtually 20 years since the stage play has be, uh, was done. And during that time, inevitably, many r reflections occur to you, many ideas that uh, you didn't explore sufficiently. Uh, I'm always surprised that more people don't actually, uh, playwrights, uh, have the temptation to uh, uh, not so much tinker with the work, but rethink parts of it, because uh, you certainly do, when, even when if you're not rewriting. Uh, I, there was a whole area towards the end of the play which never quite pleased me. Um, we got into an area, I think, of melodrama, uh, around the area of the Requiem and the mysterious Grey Messenger. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the very first version of the play, which Paul Schofield did in London, which was never seen here, uh, m uh, Salieri, on learning of this strange delusion of Mozart about a, a, a Grey Messenger um, possibly being uh, a herald of his death, uh, s dispatched his servant, a man called Greybig, who was a major character in, mm -hmm. in the play, to give, the, uh, um, to, to, to warn and to frighten Mozart. Uh, in the second version, I remember saying to Peter when we were taking this to Broadway. Peter Hall, the Peter Hall, Hall, yes, because in fact, uh, Americans never saw that version mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. uh, the one done by Schofield and Simon Callow. Uh, the second version, I said to Peter one day, you know, this is not a really very good idea, that uh, whole structure of the, s of the servant, who was a religious maniac and a very eccentric character in a long gray cape, because the person who should be at, at the wicked center of the action is Salieri. And we've slightly relegated uh, Paul Schofield to walking around the stage in a vengeful manner, not doing very much. So when I came to look at it again for Broadway, Greybig was entirely removed from the play. And so uh, Salieri took over and presented himself as the messenger and so on, mm -hmm. masked. And it was, uh, I, I think, an effective scene and uh, very theatrical which I like very much. Sure, yeah. But I always thought uh, there's more to that scene, the, what, the confrontation scene between those two men. Mm -hmm. um, I'd always wanted a confrontation scene of some kind uh, because the actual story isn't uh, in its conclusion. In fact, it hasn't got a conclusion, but in, in its uh, working out is not very satisfactory. One, Salieri 
survived the other Mozart by 32 years mm -hmm. and was successful. Well, it's not much of a climax. And, and <laughs> I, uh, I, I suppose I was to some extent thinking of the way Schiller is almost compelled by the theatricalism of, 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 of the, the, his play to I introduce that scene, the mm -hmm. famous scene of mm -hmm. uh, the confrontation between Queen Elizabeth and Mary, Queen of Scots. Right. And I felt that uh, in some ways there has to be some dramatic confrontation uh, between these two hu p protagonists in Amadeus and not necessarily a melodramatic one although the circumstances, of course, make it dramatic sure. enough. Sure. Uh, and I wanted to humanize, in some ways, a little more uh, the character of Salieri. So that he's not just a pitch black villain exactly. by the end of the play. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and that, of course, I wanted to explore a little more, what does it feel like to get up every morning to destroy the one thing that really makes life comprehensible to you and uh, worthwhile? Mm -hmm. to, to destroy music. Um, who was poisoning who, in fact? What, 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 what? So a suicidal what, act, almost, su uh, on Salieri's part, I yes. think, in destroying Mozart. Exactly. What, you know, who, what who set you to thinking about this story of artistic rivalry and artistic jealousy? I'd always been intrigued by the story, or the rumor that uh -huh. was put about that Salieri poisoned Mozart. And oddly enough, although it sounds uh, improbable. I had never read the little one-hour play called Mozart and Salieri mm -hmm. by Pushkin. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had always been in my consciousness that there was that extraordinary story. And being absolutely uh, um, obsessed by the music of Mozart, uh, I came finally to confront that legend. I began, it's been a long sto story, the, cre the creation of, of, of Amadeus. I began by having the story told by uh, a priest to whom Salieri had confessed. In fact, one reverted to that device somewhat in the movie. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was again like the, the uh, valet of, of, of uh, Salieri that I'd had in the first version. It was again too oblique. It, mm -hmm. What I needed was Salieri himself. Only five people went to the funeral of Mozart, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they were turned back. Why? They, they came back and they said there'd been a tremendous thunderstorm and they were unable to continue and reach St. Mark's Cemetery where he's being buried in an anonymous grave. And one of them was his brother-in-law, one of them was a Kapellmeister, one was, there were figures, but not family figures. The, the Constanza didn't go, she was too mm. distraught. And one was Salieri. And later I discovered that there was no thunderstorm. There were meteorological records in Vienna for that day, December 5th, uh, 1791, show a day uh, excessively mild. In other words, somewhere along the line, they'd been told to make up some story. They weren't admitted to the hmm. uh, graveyard. And I believe it was because Mozart allegedly accused uh, uh, Salieri of having poisoned him. Um, there was just perhaps in the, in the minds of court officials the possibility that it was true. They didn't really want anyone to find out where exactly where he was buried. I mean, this is a slightly far-fetched view on my part, but I mean, I began, but, you, <laughs> but that's one of those things where you began, that's what started it, right. a kind of speculation about this. But in the meantime, much more interesting things were happening. Uh, chiefly, the rather cold eyes of Salieri were looking at me, and I thought, why did you go to the... the, the the, the, the great, uh, all th that's the man mm -hmm. who I'm uh, getting very interested in as a man, as a as a, a leading figure of the drama. In fact, the original play was called oh. Salieri. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, the ambivalence in him, the, the division in himself between loving the thing he is destroying. 
well, I must say, you, you do create a character that many can identify with. In a, that is true. His uh, envy. I his mean, envy, the, the, yeah. The overweening envy that ultimately destroys him. Yes, but envy, and, but envy and something else, I think. I wanted to introduce a sense of injustice. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, a quarrel with the way things are, with God being, I, he defines himself as a small town Catholic full of dread. Right. Uh, I'm not say, a parlor sophisticate, I'm a small town Catholic. I, <laughs> paraphrasing the line. Yeah, but exactly, <laughs> absolutely. And I wanted him to appear as a, before an audience, saying, you, in, in effect, you, you, you know, a lot of you are decent, good citizens. Mm -hmm. And yet goodness is nothing in the fairness of art. I mean, I, I can't find this, and this is wrong. This is wrong. Uh, and, and it wasn't just envy. Mm -hmm. I think he, my, in my, my Salieri would not have been envious of Mozart if he also had written things he considered <laughs> of equal quality or near it. Well, that's the thing that is the most identifiable with it. It's so many artists will say, why aren't I the one? Mm -hmm. Why haven't I been given the genius? Well, it is a kind yeah. of choosing, in, a, in sure. a sense, or at least it seems so to the Salieri's of this world. Because, and he's offering these excuses, like uh, his self-justification was saying, I sat on committees to help a lot of old musicians, and I did this virtuous mm -hmm. thing. And this rather silly, rather retarded figure. Gross, vulgar uh, character. Is, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, is the, the chosen one, and this is wrong. Um, actually, the very injustice of the world should be grist to the mill of an artist. I mean, he's <laughs> right. got it all wrong. In, in that way. Does history show that Mozart was this big, as big a bore as you portray him in Amadeus? As, as, uh, a bore? Well, it's difficult. Boar, a boar, boar, yes. not, uh, not a bore, a bore. Ah, no, the, the extraordinary thing about uh, Mozart in, in this way was that he I don't know if you've read the letters of Mozart. I confess I have not. Well, <laughs> they're extraordinary because Mozart in the 19th century was represented largely as a rather porcelain figure seated at a porcelain uh, f f piano. Mm -hmm. um, a, a sublime child, a cherub with r ringlets and writing endlessly douce, sweet, imperturbable music and so on. There, nothing could be further from the truth in any of those respects. Mm. Uh, I don't see him as a boy. I think he was um, very pampered as a child, encouraged by his father to be a virtuoso and a show-off, a prodigy. Um, all Salzburgers, I think, or, or Southern Germans and, 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 and Bavarians, people of that day, tended to have when they had any humor at all, a rather coarse sense of humor. I mean, his mother had it, his father had it. There were endless jokes about farting and all that. I, it's not just him. He was a, a very wired boy. I mean, his, uh, a great intimate of his said his hands and feet never stopped moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very excitable. And he was always um, punning, rhyming, running sentences backwards. Uh, and had this incredibly infantile sense of humor. Uh, the th thing I came to dislike, actually, was the exaggerated giggle mm. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the movie, because, in fact, I'll, I, I think I slipped a bit. I think I should have written snigger rather than giggle. Because I was going to say, in the, in the script, the stage directions do say this they giggle do. that uh, just driving Salieri crazy, right. and then the movie there, that, that uh, Tom Holtz. <laughs> It became too braying, I think. Mm. What I, I, I really meant when I first started it, I think, was those kind of people who insist on telling you dirty jokes, but they tell them, you, uh, they sort of pant in your ear. They kind of sneak, I think. And, and, and it's, it's far more repellent, actually, than people who just uh, laugh outright. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that Mozart had that infantile sense of humor of, of people in, in, in mid-adolescence do have, of discovering toilet jokes and all kinds of things like that. He never got beyond that. But the point about Mozart was, and I think he did alienate a lot of people uh, because he had very, uh, um, he was a very conceited uh, uh, person. He knew he was a genius. 
the, there are many direct quotations from him in the play, of which one is, do you realize I'm the best musician in Vienna? Mm -hmm. which, which he I, I, I got him to say to Orsini Rosenberg, the director of the opera. I'm not sure he didn't say it to him, actually. Um, but when I say insensitive, there's an extraordinary story that when he visited, um, and I've gone completely dry on the name of this gentleman, uh, it, uh, who had written a ceremonial march to greet him, mm -hmm. um, Kanovich, mm -hmm. Kanovich. He was having a, a sort of flirtation with Kanovich's daughter, Rosa. And he arrived at the house of Kanovich, who had written, uh, the, the mayor of the town, I mm -hmm. think, and an amateur musician who had written a, a little march of welcome for him, or a little piece. And Mozart sat down and looked at it, turned it upside down and played it backwards, and then began to play variations on it. And Kanovich, uh, insulted, well, left the, the play, room. Yeah. And Mozart said, Did I? what? It's wrong with him. But Seems this is one of the great scenes in Amadeus, too. Salieri is asked yes. to write a little welcome. It doesn't really work, does it? Did you try? Shouldn't it be a bit more? Or this? This? Yes. I actually like that scene very much because it en encapsulates the whole story, mm -hmm. really. Those two men and that... and, and uh, and that music. And actually, I got it from the, the idea from this Kanovich story. Mm. I remember talking to a musician once, and we were talking about the play and when I was writing it. And I said, you know, it's all very well. I, Mozart can steal Salieri's girlfriend, which he does in, in, in a way, with uh, the Cavalieri, and he can do this insult and that. I mean, not intended to, to be cruel, but he does uh, the, the, kind, the kind of insult that is offered from insensitivity. Mm -hmm. But the one that will m give Salieri really lethal, dangerous, malignant thoughts must be a musical insult. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it that, that pushes him. Yes, that pushes Salieri. Yes, and it has to be uh, a musical insult that a, a, a not especially musical audience understand. Uh, and just the, the one, one's choices are very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, Beethoven cl clearly to the general public is known as ba 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 ba. You know, <laughs> if you yeah, right. do that, you know. Right, right. With Mozart, uh, there, is, there are two or three. Right. Eine kleine Nachtmusik, I suppose, is right. one. But, the, but you were writing for a Broadway audience. Broadway, uh, well, for any audience. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they can't be assumed to know uh, Mozart's uh, music that well. Mm -hmm. But almost everybody does know bum ba bum bum ba bum bum ba bum bum, and so I had to then look through lots of of marches and ceremonial music of Salieri to find something that could be turned into. I that. have to ask you: Do you like the music of Salieri? Well, I do. It has that uh, pleasing, um, rather gracious, mm -hmm. slightly. Um, neutral mu uh, sound <laughs> of the 18th century, which I do rather like. Mm -hmm. I prefer it a great deal to the, let's say, the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the themes of this play, and, and, and I think one of the themes that runs through a lot of your work, is this conflict between, on the one hand, the tightly controlled, almost repressed Salieri, and as you say, the infantile Mozart, not uh, afraid to embrace life and all the craziness. It's, it's in Lettuce and Lovage. Um, it's in Equus with the uh, the boy who blinds the horses, uh, that great emotional moment that he has, and the, the the psychologist who is so tightly coiled, but who in some ways wants to experience the the the, the heightened emotions that the boy has. Is this, is this a fair comment about the theme the theme in running through your work? I guess the Apollonian Dionysian yes. uh, conflict is the fancy way of putting it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I. Uh, um, and so far as I think about what is a unifying thing, which I try not to, mm -hmm. because that I, I, I think both of those things are in me, the, 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 that conflict between, I don't mean between being a Salieri and a Mozart, I, but I mean, <laughs> be, but that free running spirit and, uh, and, and uh, uh, almost puritanical de desire, which is connected in some senses with the desire to construct and to make 
to, 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 to author well-made plays. I know well-made became a kind of insult for some reason. I never understood that. I mean, what's, what's the alter alternative? Badly Sloppy. made? Sloppy. <laughs> 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 and if a thing is so well-made, you know, in other words, that its form insists over its content, then it's not well-made, actually. Mm -hmm. It's called, you know, that's not well-made. Mm -hmm. to, to dissolve one in the other is the, is, is the prescription for that. Um, but I do feel that is in, 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 uh, probably in my thought and in my writing and in my life, one side of me uh, and the other side is... Um, uh, oh, the crazy zany Peter Schaffer <laughs> behind closed doors. Yes, <laughs> and I, I suppose if when I try and create Sarieri, I, I, I would tap into the, uh, the envy I felt sometimes for anarchic spirits. Mm -hmm. um, people who, are in who live totally in the present. Mm -hmm. I even find, my, find myself occasionally, if I'm envious, and this is, sounds ludicrous, envying, say, say, dogs. The way a dog, if you ha have a, a, a favorite dog or a pet dog, you, you, you watch it. It lives only in the present. Right. Uh, it's biddable to anything, and you say, hey, and immediately, what, what, what? Right. Uh, what, what are we doing? What? And with no reflection, in a way, it sounds sentimental there, but it is a cause of, Envy in me. I wish, I wish more and more I could uh, to it's my the life. The curse of being, uh, in, being a human being that uh, you, you do have reflection and oh you yes. do stop you and do. think about your life and yes. then get depressed about it often. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, yes. Uh, my problem is ha hesitation, I think, and uncertainty about do I do this or that or too much all the time. It's caution. And caution can become a kind of uh, threat to, to, to any kind of free running improvisation to a certain mm. extent that it can, can, can damage one's psyche, I think. Now, um, your, your brother is uh, another fine playwright, Anthony Schaffer, who specializes in, um, in mystery thrillers, a genre I'm afraid we just don't see very much of anymore. He did Sleuth and oh, yeah. Murderer. Um, are, you, are you close? Are you, he lives in Australia, right? Well, he has done that. He's now living in London. Mm -hmm. uh, You're twins. We're twins, yes. And, and are you very, close to each other? Very, do you, do you very. show each other first drafts oh, of yes. the script? Oh, yes. In fact, I was lucky because I actually got to be the first person to read the manuscript of Sleuth. And I didn't know the trick. There was no, uh, well, we all know it now, so I suppose one can reveal it, you know, that there is no uh, other person on stage than the other character. There, there, there are only two people in the whole play. Right. The program lists five. Yes. Right, right, and right. so and I, n I had no program or anything. I just read, you know, exactly what was uh, on the page um, without any fake biographies or anything like that. It mm -hmm. was just done, um, and I, I, I fell hook, line, and sinker for the, for the trick. Yeah. It, well, I mean, the two of, we talked about this earlier, but there is, a, I think, a link between the two of you. You both do write a well-made, well-constructed play. Why do you think that the well-constructed play has sort of fallen out of favor? I think wrongly and sadly, and I think deplorably, actually. Why, I think, I don't know that there's been I've observed this both in England and even more in this country, where I live now, you know, for most of the time, mm -hmm. that, that, let's say, that the dramatic cake, the cake of drama, used to be cut up into slices, what, what, what we might call genre slices, if that's how you pronounce it. Gee, I've never known how, genre plays. Genre that play, there was yeah. indeed the thriller, the, the, the courtroom drama. The boulevard the, comedy. The boulevard comedy, the high comedy, the farce, right. which is a very difficult medium. It attracted me uh, in, in my life uh, quite a lot. Um, now it's been replaced by sociological slices. There's the black play, the femme lib play, there's the gay play, there's the Jewish play, and so on. And I find this stultifying, hmm. I think, because I, I, I even wonder whether people tend just to go to their own genres rather a lot. I don't know. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, that uh, gays go to gay plays, black go to, go to black plays. And I wonder whether this is true or not. Hmm. I think it may be. And well, I, don't, I don't like it. I love the idea of of play play. Right. Of, well, I think you, you, it's a very good point. I think the theater has become ghettoized in many ways. You, yes. know, you get the sense that a lot of these playwrights are just writing for themselves and the people that they know. Yes. Whereas what's wonderful about your plays, you write about Mozart. A lot of people don't know very much about Mozart, but you make this compelling play of universal themes of yes. rivalry and envy. Yes. Yes. I mean, couldn't get a better plug than that for Amadeus. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter Schaffer, it's been delightful having you on the show tonight. Amadeus is at the Music Box Theater opening December 15th. And uh, we wish you luck uh, with a great play. Thank you very much. Oh, he put the Masons into it right enough. Oh, yes, but how? 
He had turned them into a secret order of priests. I heard voices calling out of ancient temples. I saw a vast sun rise on a timeless land where animals danced and children floated. And by its rays, all the poisons we feed each other drawn up and burned away. And in this sun, behold, I saw his father. No more an accusing figure, but forgiving. The highest priest of the order, his hands extended to the world in love. Wolfgang feared Leopold no longer. Oh, the sound. The sound of that newfound peace in him. There was the magic flute. There, beside me. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, and public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theatre Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing exciting opportunities for theatre lovers. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.